الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا ربنا بما علمتنا وزدنا من كرمك علما يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم طهر قلوبنا وأزل عيوبنا وتولنا بالحسن وزينا بالتقوى واجمع لنا خيري الآخرة والأولى وارزقنا طاعتك ما أبقيتنا يا رحمن ويا رحيم اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وعلمنا بالحلم وزينا بالعلم وجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وجعلنا من المتقربين إليك على علم وهدى وبصيرة يا فتاح يا عليم وصل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا ونور قلوبنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أمين الحمد لله بيد النعمة of الله سبحانه وتعالى and his karam and his fadl upon us We'll continue with the text, the 40 hadith by Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullahu subhanahu wa ta'ala wa nafa'ana bih. Before we continue, there is a question from the previous lesson that I got and that was why or how come there is a difference of opinion concerning the name of a companion. The name of the narrator, we said that the narrator said either Abu Amra or Abu Amr. I don't know the answer to the question. Maybe people who yani, did takhassus in hadith, people whose field is more hadith and they study ilm al-rijal with a greater depth probably would be able to answer the question better. I don't know why. What I can say about that particular hadith or that particular narrator is that he wasn't a companion from whom a lot of hadith were narrated. For example, Imam Muslim, At-Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah, that hadith, that 21st hadith that we covered, that's the only hadith they collected from that particular companion. Imam Al-Nasai collected that one and another one, just two hadith from him. I don't know if that matters, and that's why he's not uh, well known, or they couldn't really ascertain exactly what his name was, but Allahu A'lam. So we'll continue. From where we stop, which is the 22nd hadith, we started by mentioning that it was narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. So Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullahu ta'ala narrates through an unbroken chain of narration to Abi Abdullah, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari radiallahu anhuma anna rajulan sa'ala rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama faqal أرأيت إذا صليت الصلوات المكتوبات وصمت رمضان وأحللت الحلال وحرمت الحرام ولم أزد على ذلك شيئا أدخل الجنة قال نعم رواه مسلم. So Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari رضي الله عنه said that a person came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and said this in, in hadith is called mubham Where it says for example in a hadith it says A person came, a man came, a woman said Without mentioning who that person is It means that that person is mubham That person is not really known from the narration Other narrations might clarify it Or they might remain unknown Which does not affect the validity of the hadith because the hadith is verified based on the chain of narration and it goes all the way back to Jabir and Jabir is narrating and Jabir is Adil and he, all of the companions are Udul the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that every companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is upright and a proper narrator of of the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it's not permissible to believe that any of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu were not credible reporters. This is not permissible. It's haram to believe any, no matter who they are, any companion of the Prophet Sallallahu 
to believe that all of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were not upright is kufr. So if somebody said, I do, I do not believe yani all of the companions, I believe all of them were incre- uh, not credible, that person has committed kufr. So because it goes back to Jabir, it, yani not naming who the person is does not affect the validity of the hadith. Others, yani the muhaddithun, make it a point to try to identify every mubham person in the sunnah. There are books of hadith that just try to identify who those people are. Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the sections of his book, Tahdeeb al-Asma wal lughat is dedicated to identifying the mubham people mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet So according to some of the scholars of hadith, this person that Jabir said a man came, his name is an numan ibn Qawqal. an numan ibn Qawqal radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. So according to many of the muhaddithun, Nu'man ibn Qawqal is the person referred to here who asked the Prophet sallallahu the following question. Nu'man ibn Qawqal was among the people who died in the battle of Uhud. He's from the shuhada of Uhud. In fact, there's a story where the Prophet sallallahu when he was having a discussion with the companions on what to do before the battle of Uhud. And should we stay in Medina and fortify the city or should we abandon the city? Should we leave? And should we take the people out to safety? And while they were having that discussion, Nu'man ibn Qawqal came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Ya Rasulullah, do not prevent me from entering Jannah. And he said, how and how would that happen? And Nu'man ibn Qawqal said, I saw, and I had a vision that I would die in the battle of Uhud. And he died in the battle of Uhud. So Nu'man ibn Qawqal radiallahu anhu came and he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari's report, أَرَأَيْتَ إِذَا صَلَيْتُ الصَّلَوَاتِ الْمَكْتُوبَاتِ So he's asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the wording he said here is أَرَأَيْتَ يعني, Do you see? Do you? رأى in the Arabic language can mean see يعني, with the eyes. Or it can also mean see with the intellect. Do you think? So somebody can say, I see this glass. And they can use the word, ra'a, yani ara, I see. They can use that same word to mean I think. And this is something that I see yani with the intellect. So an important question here for the scholars of usul al-fiqh is, did the Prophet ﷺ say anything by ijtihad? Anything from the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, did he arrive to anything of it through ijtihad? Ijtihad means using his own juristic discretion based on what he knows from revelation. Did he, of his own ijtihad, come up with rulings of the sharia? And um, there's a difference of opinion among the scholars of usul al fiqh. The majority of the scholars of the Shafi'i madhhab say it was possible. Nothing prevents that. It's rationally possible. And it is. Uh, and it, there's nothing to say that it couldn't happen. It's rationally possible. And it is possible by sharia. Rationally possible, meaning it is not. it is neither necessary nor impossible. Possible by sharia, meaning there's nothing in the sharia that would prevent it and make it haram. So they say it's possible. Then there's a difference of opinion among those who say that it's possible whether it actually happened or not. So according to, again, majority of the Shafi'i scholars, there are, it could be argued that it did happen, that there are rulings of the Sharia in which the Prophet ﷺ used his own ijtihad. But once he announced those rulings and there's nothing in the revelation that corrected it or said anything against it, it means that it was approved of by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in effect, these are the rulings that were given to the ummah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a discussion in usul al-fiqh. When the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum, when they would ask something like, Ara'ayta, what does that mean? Are they asking him, do you think personally? Or are they asking, do you know 
based on revelation if and then they give their question. So according to the scholars of hadith, not the scholars of usul, according to the scholars of hadith, when the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum would ask the Prophet sallallahu do you think X, Y, Z? What they mean is, do you know based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you whether X, Y, Z? Because they know that he would not answer anything that is not approved of by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, ara'ayta, yani, do you know? If, he said, إِذَا صَلَّيْتُ الصَّلَوَاتِ الْمَكْتُوبَاتِ If I pray the fard prayers, which for majority means the five prayers. And for some of the scholars of fiqh, some of the fuqaha, it includes witr. Yani, the fard prayers include witr. But according to the Shafi'i school, it's the five prayers. So if I pray only the five prayers that have been recommended, that have been prescribed by Allah Azza wa Jal, commanded. وَصُمْتُ رَمَضَانَ And I fast in the month of Ramadan. Here, like previous hadith that we've pointed out, this hadith is an evidence for the Shafi'i position that it is not makruh to say Ramadan without saying month. Some of the fuqaha, they say if you say Ramadan, you must say month of Ramadan. Not must, yani you should say the month of, not just Ramadan. According to the Shafi'i Madhab, it's not makruh. And these uh, ahadith prove it. Yani the companions said Ramadan and the Prophet ﷺ did not object to that. So if I pray the prayers, and I fast in the month of Ramadan. If I fast Ramadan, then he said, أَأَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ Or, uh, sorry, he continued, وَأَحْلَلْتُ الْحَلَالَ وَحَرَّمْتُ الْحَرَامَ وَلَمْ أَزِدْ عَلَى ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا So if I fast, if I pray the fard prayers, I fast in the month of Ramadan, وَأَحْلَلْتُ الْحَلَالَ If I do what is halal. وَحَرَّمْتُ الْحَرَامَةِ And I stay away from what is haram. These two sentences have you know, two meanings. أَحْلَلْتُ الْحَلَالَةِ وَحَرَّمْتُ الْحَرَامَةِ First of all, it includes I believe in the halalness of what is halal. أَحْلَلْتُ الْحَلَالَةِ means whatever the Prophet ﷺ taught is halal, I accept as being halal. So first there must be a, a belief. If any Muslim believes that something halal is haram, then that belief is a belief of kufr. If something is halal by ijma', there's no dispute about it among the fuqaha. Everybody knows that it's halal. And a Muslim says, I believe that it is haram or it should be haram, then that belief and that statement are beliefs and statements of kufr. Because people are assigning to themselves something that can only belong to Allah Azza wa Jal and that is the right of determining sharia. Ah. So if somebody says Allah has the right to determine sharia, ah, but then say I believe that something Allah says is halal should be haram or is haram, then that person is in effect saying Allah plus me can determine what sharia ah is. Or they're saying, Allah, I believe Allah can determine what sharia ah is, but I am displeased with one of his rulings. So because of those meanings, it is kufr for somebody to say something that is clearly halal is haram or should be haram. If somebody says, I believe marrying more than one wife should be haram, or that it is in fact haram, we say this, yeah, this is kufr. We're not calling the person kafir, but we're saying this statement is a statement of Kufr. So first there must be a belief. So he said, Ahlaltu al-halala. Everything that you say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is halal, I accept it. And I only act in accordance with it. This second part, only act in accordance with, this is optional for the entrance into Jannah. But believing that is halal is necessary. So to believe that a halal is not halal is kufr. If somebody knows that it's clearly halal. But to leave off acting according to halal is only ma'asiyah. 
It's a sin but not kufr. So, and then the second sentence is وَحَرَّمْتُ الْحَرَامَ Same thing. I believe that everything that you, he's speaking to the Prophet ﷺ, I believe that everything that you say is haram is in fact haram. So there's the belief of it. And same thing applies to what we just mentioned. If somebody believes that something that is haram by ijma' if somebody believes it's halal and that's an act of kufr or that it should be halal. So if somebody says, I believe fornication should be halal or that eating pig should be halal, yani this is kufr. Because these are matters that are clearly haram by ijma'. Every body in the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ believe that this is haram. So, وَحَرَّمْتُ الْحَرَامَ So I believe that it's haram and I act in accordance to that, meaning I stay away from that which is haram. Again, to believe in it, any to disbelieve in it is kufr. But to act in accordance to it, Yani by doing something haram, once we believe that it's haram, is only ma'asiyah. So, وَأَحْلَلْتُ الْحَلَالَ وَحَرَّمْتُ الْحَرَامَ means that I believe that which is halal is halal and I act accordingly. And I believe that which is haram is haram and I act accordingly. وَلَمْ أَزِدْ عَلَى ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا And I don't do anything beyond that. أَأَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ would I enter Jannah? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Nah, yes. When he said, What Jannah? Would I enter Jannah? What he means here is, Would I enter Jannah on the day of judgment with the people who enter Jannah without punishment? Otherwise, just belief, just tawheed is enough for entrance into Jannah. You need, people, Muslims will be punished. Some Muslims, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal not to be among them, will be punished in Jahannam before entering Jannah. Those Muslims, all they need to enter Jannah if eventually is La ilaha illallah. The Prophet Wasallam said, anybody who says La ilaha illallah dakhala al-Jannah will enter Jannah. And by says La ilaha illallah, he means Believe, you know, whoever believes that there is no God but Allah and they believe in everything that comes with that sentence will enter Jannah, even if they have to be punished first. So when this companion is saying, أَأَدْخُلُ Jannah," what he means is, will I enter Jannah without punishment? Not generally, because generally you don't need to act according to what is halal and leave off what is haram. You, know, you don't need that. You just need to believe in it. For entrance into Jannah. So when he said, أَأَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ Would I enter Jannah on the day of judgment with the people who would not be punished? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes. Now this hadith indicates necessarily that it is not, it is not essential for somebody to enter Jannah on the day of judgment without punishment that they do Yani tatawwa'at That they do extra ibadah Because the companion said I only pray the five I only fast in the month of Ramadan He didn't mention hajj and zakah The ulama say either A Because he was not qualified for either He didn't have the amount of money So he, was, he didn't have to pay zakah And he didn't have the means of traveling for hajj Or it can mean that these two ibadah were not yet fard. These are two responses from the scholars of hadith. Why hajj and zakah are not mentioned in this hadith. But what he means is the arkan of Islam, the necessary actions of Islam. So he's saying, if I only do what I have to do, is that enough? And the Prophet wasallam said, yes. So that would indicate that a person doesn't have to do more than just what is wajib. Now, it proves the permissibility of that. It's permissible. And it proves that somebody can be saved on Yom Al-Qiyamah without doing extra. But it doesn't mean that doing extra is not requested in the dunya. These are two separate things. If somebody says, 
Am I required to do more? Is there a talab? Is there a request from the Sharia for me to do more? Yes, there is. Somebody says now, do I have to do more in order to enter Jannah? No, you don't have to. So the Sharia requests it. And there are many fawa'id for it. And all of the other ahadith that the Prophet ﷺ told to so many other companions about doing extra is evidence that we should be doing extra. And the Sharia asks us to do extra. And leaving off tatawwa'at, there are consequences to it. In the dunya, for example, it takes away a person's adala. If, for example, we know that somebody prays salah and they do not say subhana rabbi al-a'la, subhana rabbi al-azim in the ruku'ah, in the sujood, because these are only sunan. It doesn't affect the validity of the salah. If we know that somebody doesn't do them all the time, regularly, they pray and they don't do these sunan. It takes away from their adala. Meaning a judge, according to the Shafi'i madhab, can reject the testimony of a witness if somebody comes to the judge and says, this person is not upright, why? Because he leaves off the sunan in everything. So it has consequences in the dunya. It takes away your status as a, as a Muslim, as an adil. The reason for that is if this person is making light of the sunnah, then how can we trust what he has to say in a matter of, of law, of court? Because remember in court situations, we're going to, you know, it could result in uh, instituting penalties against Muslims. So we can't put a penalty on another Muslim based on the word of somebody who takes the sunnah lightly. So yeah, it's permissible it's not haram to leave off those sunan. It doesn't affect the validity of your prayer, but it takes away from your adala. And leaving off sunan, if it is done with disdain for the sunnah, or it is done by treating the sunnah as light and not important, or it is done by thinking that some other way is superior then the sunnah, then this is kufr. This is kufr. Because now it's not a matter of I'm too lazy to implement the sunnah. It's not a matter of I know that this is better and this is the way of the Prophet wasallam, and this is from the teachings of Islam and this is what the righteous people do but I'm too lazy. If that's it, then that's okay because you're acknowledging the superiority of the sunnah. You're acknowledging the place of the sunnah. You're acknowledging the beauty of the sunnah. You're just admitting that I'm too lazy to do it. But if somebody has disdain for the sunnah, if somebody says, hey, don't eat in that way, eat in this way because it's sunnah, and the person said, no, that's nonsense. Or if somebody says, no, I think this is better. If somebody says, that's backwards. If somebody says, that's for people in Arabia, it's not for people in civilized... Any one of these statements is a statement of kufr. Because the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is the best way of anything. The way he walked is the best way of walking. The way he spoke is the best way of speaking. The way he slept is the best way of sleeping. The way he ate is the best way of eating. So we must believe that. We must be because the Quran says that he, yani anything he, he was ala khuluqin azim. And the Quran says that laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana liman kana yarju Allah wal yawm al akhir wa dhakar Allah kathira. That in the Messenger of Allah is the best example for you. So to believe that any other way is superior is a belief of kufr. This is why in the books of fiqh they say, for example, if somebody is slaughtering an animal, for in the Shafi'i madhab, they don't have to say anything for it to be halal. The person, do, it's not a requirement, it's not wajib for the person who makes the slaughter to say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. None of that is wajib. Although the person it has to be a Muslim, or has to be from Ahlul Kitab with the condition that's mentioned in the books of Fiqh, which is a strict condition that most people won't be able to fulfill today. 
That's all. They just need to do that. And then the cutting has to be done based on what is wajib there. You have to cut the, uh, the windpipe. You need to cut the wadajain. Yani that, it's halal. Saying the dhikr is sunnah. But if somebody is slaughtering the animal and another person comes to him and say, say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, Allahumma salli ala nabi because it's sunnah and the person refuses out of disdain for the sunnah or refuses out of clear rejection of a teaching of the Prophet wasallam, the animal becomes haram. We can't eat that animal. Or at least it becomes doubtful. If somebody thinks that that statement was said out of Disdain for the sunnah, belittling the sunnah. If just out of laziness, no problem. If out of disdain for the sunnah, or if we're unsure, was it laziness, the person just felt lazy to say the dhikr, or is it the person making light of the sunnah? Was that a rejection of the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa or is that lazy? If we're in doubt, then it's not permissible to eat that animal. We can take that person to court and then he would have to clarify what he meant in front of a qadi. And then the qadi would have to give a judgment concerning that. But that's how serious it is. So, and this is why it's like if somebody is angry, you're in an argument with somebody, you don't tell them this is sunnah or that is sunnah. Because you don't want them to reject what you're saying. Because you don't want them to reject the sunnah because of their anger. So, the hadith indicates the permissibility of leaving off sunan acts as long as it is not out of disdain for the sunnah or making light of the sunnah or belittling the sunnah or saying that a different way is better than the way of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he said, أَأَدْخُلَ Jannah, الْجَنَّةِ Would I enter Jannah if I just do the basics? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Naam, yes, rawahu uh, Muslim. This hadith was reported by Imam Muslim ibn al-Hajjaj radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. Then we move on to the 23rd hadith. Al-Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullahu ta'ala wa nafa'ana bih narrates through an unbroken chain of narration that goes back to Abi Malik al-Harith ibn Asim al-Ash'ari. رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الطهور شطر الإيمان والحمد لله تملأ الميزان وسبحان الله والحمد لله تملأان أو تملأ ما بين السماوات والأرض والصلاة نور والصدقة برهان والصبر ضياء والقرآن حجة لك أو عليك كل الناس يغدو فبائع نفسه فمعتقها أو موبقها رواه مسلم. So he narrates from Abi Malik al Harith ibn Asim al Ashari. Some narrations say uh, al Harith ibn Amir instead of al Harith ibn Asim. Al Ashari and al Imam al Bukhari رضي الله عنه narrated this hadith with doubt in the name. And Imam al-Bukhari said, yani, an Abi Malik ibn al-Harith aw Amir. So he narrated it that way. It's either Ibn Asim or Ibn Amir. Al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu. This Ash'ari here is not the same as the tribe to which Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu is attributed. This is a different tribe. This is a Yemeni tribe uh, to which he was. Attributed, so he was from the Yemeni tribes. So he narrated. He said, "The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, 'At-tuhur shatr al-iman, that purity is half of iman." Al-Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah taala, like many of the muhaddithun, say that the word should be tuhur, though. Majority of the narrations say Tahur. Majority of the narrations of the hadith, the word is not Tahur but Tahur with a fatha. In fact, Imam al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah ta'ala, 
said that no one narrated it with Dhamma. No one narrated it with Tuhur. Yani no one that he found. He found no narration that said Tuhur instead of Tahur. Other muhaddithun say no, it has been narrated with Tuhur. And in fact, in terms of meaning, that is the preferred pronunciation. Tuhur instead of Tahur. Because the meaning is different. Tuhur with a Dhamma is the act of purification. Tahur with a Fatha is the thing with which the act of purification is done. So if we're purifying with water, the water is called Tahur. The act of washing is called Tuhur. It's a form of Arabic. For example, in the when we eat to fast in the month of Ramadan, the act of eating is called Suhur. What we eat itself is called Sahur with a Fatha. Same thing here. So Wadu is the thing we use to do the act. Wudu is the act itself. So in terms of meaning, Al-Imam al-Nawawi and others say that it should be Tuhur, not Tahur. At-Tuhur shatrul iman That purity is half of faith. Now the ulama differ as to the meaning of this. There are like three meanings or primary understanding or interpretation of that, of that part of the hadith. So at-tuhur in the Arabic language, purity or purifying in the Arabic language, that word tuhur means to purify something from that which is not necessary or that which corrupts it, whether that thing is physical or non-physical. So to pur- purify your mind of that which can corrupt it in the Arabic language can properly be called tuhur. To purify some physical object that is dirty, to wash it in the Arabic language can be properly called tuhur. So tuhur means to purify something from that which uh, filthifies it, whether that thing is physical or non-physical. So based on that meaning, some of the ulama interpret the hadith to mean that purifying the self is half of iman. Because Iman, according to the Ash'ari school, Iman is a belief in the heart, statement on the tongue, and action of the body. But the belief of the heart can be corrupt. With bid'ah, if somebody believes that which cannot be believed about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they say, la ilaha illallah, but then they believe things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that cannot be believed about Allah azza wa jalla. They believe that Allah has emotions and they believe that Allah is contained in space and they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves about. And they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can develop different characteristics and attributes that he didn't have before that makes him better and more complete. These are all beliefs that cannot, we cannot have these beliefs about Allah. So your beliefs can be corrupt. And Iman is a statement of the tongue. That statement of the tongue can be corrupt. People can say things that cannot be said about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or about the Quran or about the Sharia, about the prophets, about anything that is necessary in the religion and actions of the body. People can invent actions that are not permissible. They can be clearly haram or they can corrupt good actions by doing that which is makruh. So, tuhur. Shatrul Iman means, based on that interpretation, that half of your faith rests in purifying your belief, the belief of, in your heart, the statement of your tongue, and the actions of your body, purifying those from corruption. So half of Iman is to believe what has to be believed, to say what must be said, and to do what must be done. And the other half is to not do what cannot be done, not say what cannot be said, and not believe what cannot be believed. So at tuhur shatrul iman. So one half is to is to establish iman, and the other half is to purify iman from that which is or that which can corrupt it.
So that's one interpretation of the hadith. Another interpretation of the hadith is that purification, yani, to purify the Muslim purifying his body, purifying his clothing, purifying his environment, to remain clean all the time is part of Iman. Shatr in the Arabic language can mean half or it can mean a part of. The word nisf, the word half in the Arabic language can mean literally half or it can mean a part of. Even in the English language we have that meaning where we use the word half not to mean an exact half but just a piece of. Somebody, a kid says to his, to his or her mother, give me half of your cake. Just give me a piece of it, give me a bite of it even. Or somebody says, like somebody asks for something and you give it and they take a bite and the person says, hey, I gave you a little piece, you took half of it. But that mean you actually took half, like if you were to measure it, you actually took half. It means you took a piece of it. So based on the interpretation that at tuhuru shatrul iman, purity, physical cleanliness is a part of Iman. It doesn't mean half of Iman, it means a part of Iman. Because we know that Iman, we have this concept in the religion of Shu'ab al-Iman. And it's based on a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that Iman bid'un wa sabi'ina shu'abah. That Iman has about 70 something parts. So there are books written any a genre of literature in the classical literature of Islam or, or of the muhaddithun specifically is called any literature on shu'ab al-iman and imam al-halimi the most authoritative work on shu'ab al-iman was written by imam al-halimi it's a four volume work called al-minhaj fi shu'ab al-iman in which he discussed all of the different parts that constitutes the actions of Iman and one by Imam Al-Bayhaqi rahimahullah with the same name called Shu'ab Al-Iman and there's the most famous one probably is a book called Mukhtasar Shu'ab Al-Iman by Imam Al-Qazwini it's a summary of Imam Al-Bayhaqi Shu'ab Al-Iman so we have this concept of Shu'ab Al-Iman where Different parts, different actions constitutes the action that represents the actions of Iman, the actions of a mu'min, somebody who has Iman. So based on that meaning of all the different parts that make up what a believer does, a part of that is cleanliness, to be clean. So somebody to act, yani if someone acts in contrariety to that, they're not clean, we say you are Neglecting a part of Iman, a part of what makes a mu'min a mu'min. And you are you're giving up an action from the actions of Iman. According to some of the scholars of Kalam, there's a major dispute among the scholars of Kalam concerning actions. And what, to what degree are actions part of the makeup of Iman? Are actions part of what we call Iman? The word Iman, yes sir, there's a major debut, uh, dispute in the scholars, uh, in the books of Kalam. So one way to resolve that according to some of the mutakallimun is to say that Iman has an asl and has a farah. Iman has a root, which is the essence of it, and then it has many branches, which are the non-essential parts of it. So the way they look at it is that Iman is tazdiq. Iman is the belief in the heart of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and everything that uh, is implied by that. But So that's the asl of Iman. If somebody says that, it's enough for them in the akhirah to enter into Jannah, to be considered a mu'min with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the akhirah. If they say the kalima of tawheed in the dunya, then that's enough for the rulings of Islam to be applied to them in the dunya, in terms of inheritance, in terms of 
what happens to them when they die? Do they get janazah? Are they, do we owe them to wash their bodies and shroud them and all of that? All of those rulings that relates to the rulings of a Muslim applies to them if they say la ilaha illallah in the dunya. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Everything beyond that, salah, zakah, sawm, hajj, all of these are, are furu'ah al-iman. So we have the asl of iman, we have that which is said necessarily it is wajib to follow the asl of iman, and then we have furu'ah al-iman or shu'ab al-iman. The shu'ab, all the actions that we need to do according to the sharia. So part of that is cleanliness, to always be clean, to brush the teeth, to purify any. The wajib cleanliness is to remove najasa from the body when it's necessary. Yani when it's necessary, meaning in order to pray and stuff like that. The wajib aspect is to remove any najasa from the masjid. This is wajib. Or anything, when it comes to the masjid, not only are we uh, obligated to remove najasa, but anything mustaqdar, anything that is repulsive to the human being, is wajib. If somebody throws a banana skin in the masjid and it starts to rot, it's wajib to remove that. It's haram to throw rotten banana skins in the masjid. You know, some people you see, they sit in the masjid, they're not thinking about it, but they sit in the masjid and they're peeling off like hang nails from their thing and they're dropping into the masjid, they dig off dry skin from there, or they pick their beard and the hair, for all of this is not permissible, we can't do that to the masjid. So when Imam al-Bukhari used to go into the masjid and see all of these little things that he can pick up with his hands and take it outside and, and drop it outside of the masjid. This was something that he did, radiallahu ta'ala, and this is wajib, this is wajib cleanliness. Beyond that, beyond the wajib cleanliness, the mustahab cleanliness is to always be clean except when the sharia dictates otherwise. There are certain times in which the sharia stipulates that we shouldn't be uh, take too much care of perfuming the body and stuff like that. In hajj, for example, because we, we want to be disheveled and we want to be in a state that shows our desperation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Ramadan while fasting, even outside of Ramadan, according to the Shafi'i school, it's not that you go about smelling bad, but it's it's makru to use ether and perfume and stuff. Because again, in the fasting, you want to show a state of desperation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beyond that, in the Shafi'i madhab, we say that it is mustahab to brush the teeth in all situations, all the time. Anytime you can brush the teeth, it's Mustahab, except after zawal, while you're fasting. After dhuhr, while you're fasting, according to the mu'tamal of the madhab, and even then, according to the ikhtiyar of Imam al nawawi and others, even then, you can, it's not makruh. But beyond that, to always be clean, always smell good, always uh, cut your nails. These are cleanliness that are mustahab, not to look in a way that you yani, need to look unbathed and unkept. Some people think that it's zuhud, it's part of the religion to look, you yani, don't wear iron clothing, to go about, don't use hair products, don't use cream on your skin. I actually heard one religious speaker once telling people it's bid'ah to use cream on your skin. Yani, this is ajib. It's not. And one time, one of the companions was looking like this. And the Prophet ﷺ called him. He was sending them out to do da'wah. He called him back and he told them, clean your clothes and take care of your hair until yani, takunu nas, until you become like a sparkle among people. People should not only see you as not being dirty, but they should recognize that you're clean. You should be so clean that it stands out for your cleanliness. That you become like a sparkle among people. There's another time a man came and his hair was all over the place and he was dressed bad and he smelled bad. And the Prophet wasallam said that uh, wouldn't it be better if he goes back and don't come looking like a devil? 
Because people can be scared by other people that look that way. Right? If you're walking down the street and you see one guy well dressed, proper, and he looks, his limbs are to him, say he walks very, you're going to be less scared of that person than if somebody who's dressed bad, hair all over the place, walking about like he doesn't, it can scare, it can intimidate human beings. So the Prophet said, wouldn't it be better if he come back not looking like a devil? I mean, not looking like a shaitan. So it's not zuhud to not take care of yourself or to be in a, in a way that people are repulsed by you. So Muslims, so according to some of the scholars, that's what the hadith mean. Cleanliness is from the shu'ab al-iman, from the parts of iman. According to Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, and majority of the scholars of hadith, the muhaddithun, tuhur in this hadith refers to wudu and the ghusl. At-tuhuru, shatru al-iman, that cleanliness is half of iman, means wudu and the ghusl. This is why uh, al-imam Muslim and al-Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah and al-Nasai, they all collected this hadith in the section on al-wudu. And where the muhaddithun placed a particular hadith indicates their understanding of the hadith. This is a general principle of studying hadith is we understand what the collector, what the muhaddith understood of the meaning of the hadith based on which chapter he put the hadith in. So in Sahih Muslim, in the Jami' al-Tirmidhi and in the Sunan of al Nasai and Ibn Majah, this hadith is placed under the chapter of al-wudu because they understood tuhur here to mean wudu or ghusl and the reason for that is language we say in 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 the study of usul al-fiqh and in the study of lugha we say that words have three haqaiq meaning three realities one is the haqiqat lughawiyyah the meaning that it was assigned in the language, the linguistic meaning. Haqiqa here means not figurative, not metaphoric. It has, when it is said, what immediately comes to the mind. So there's three types of that. In other words, in order for it to be non-haqiqi, there must be something in the context that indicates that what comes immediately to the mind is not what is intended. If we don't have anything based on the context to indicate that that's not what is intended, then the default is to understand it based on the haqaiq. So there are three types of haqaiq. Haqaiq lughawiyya, haqaiq urfiyya. Urfiyya means how it is used in a particular context. So for example, among mathematicians, there are certain words as soon as they use it, all mathematicians will understand one meaning. That meaning that will come to mind is called haqaiq, haqiqa, but because it's a specific group of people, it's called haqiqatun urfiyya. And the urf can be either a particular field or a particular place. Like if you go to like Egypt, for example, you say certain things, those words all Egyptians would understand to mean a particular thing. Unless there's something that indicates otherwise, that's what they will understand from it. So that is based on the urf of that particular place. Same thing in Malaysia, same thing in the Caribbean, same thing in America. There are certain words, once you use it, everybody understands what it means. So that is called haqiqatun urfiya. And then you have what is called haqiqatun shar'iyya where the sharia determines the usage of the word. So there are certain words where the, you'll have a conflict between the haqiqat lughawiyya and the haqiqat shar'iyya. But if it is used in the context of shara, of sharia, then which meaning do you expect to be intended? The haqiqa shar'iyya. For example, salah. Salah in the Arabic language doesn't mean a, a bunch of Movements with a specific intention that starts with a takbir and ends with a taslim. That's not what it means in the Arabic language. Before Islam, sal salah didn't mean that. 
So the meaning of it in the language is differ, different from the meaning in the Sharia. Ah. But every time a Muslim says Salah, the Quran says Salah. The Prophet Sallallahu said Salah. What do we expect the meaning to be? Not the linguistic meaning, but the Shari meaning. So the Muhaddithun, what they argue here is who is speaking? The Prophet Sallallahu What is he speaking as? He's speaking in the capacity of somebody who is giving the teachings of Islam. So then what do you expect him to mean with the words that he say? The Shari meaning. So what is the Shari meaning of Tuhur? Wudu and Ghusl. So for them, that's why they say the meaning of the Hadith. Tuhur is not general cleanliness. It is Wudu and the Ghusl. So based on that, what is the meaning of Salah in that context? If according to the Muhaddithun, uh, not Salah, sorry, Iman. If according to the Muhaddithun, the meaning of the Hadith, the meaning of Tuhur in the Hadith is Wudu, then what is the meaning of Iman? Because the Hadith says, At-Tuhur shatrul Iman. That Tuhur is half of Iman. For them, Iman in the Hadith means Salah. Because the Quran uses the word Iman to mean Salah. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِيمَانَكُمْ Allah Azza wa Jalla would not cause your Iman to go to waste. What, is that? what does Iman mean in the ayah? This ayah was revealed when the Qibla changed from Jerusalem to the Kaaba, Al-Sharifa. زَادَهَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَلَى تَقْرِيمًا وَتَشْرِيفًا وَتَعْلِيمًا when the Qibla changed, some of the companions asked the Prophet ﷺ, what will happen to the Salah of the companions who died only praying to the first direction, to the direction of Baytul Maqdis? Because if the Qibla changed and they all prayed to that direction, what happened to their Salah? Does it mean that they were facing a wrong direction? The Qur'an revealed as an answer to their question, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إيمانكم. Allah would not cause any one of you, any one of your Iman not to count. But what is meant here? What was being asked about? Iman or Salah? Salah. So the Quran used the word Iman to mean Salah. Why? Again, Iman is a belief in the heart, statements by the tongue, and actions by the body. Salah involves a niyyah in the heart, takbira, and recitation of fatiha with the tongue, and tashahud with the tongue, and sajda, ruku'ah, tashahud, jalsa, all of that are actions of the body. So because salah involves or it represents fully an act of iman and it involves the same places of iman, the Qur'an described it as being Iman. <coughs> so, <coughs> according to the scholars of Hadith, or majority of them, At-Tuhuru Shatrul Iman means Wudu and the ghusl, the tahara, is half of the prayer. Meaning it's a condition for the validity of the prayer. If somebody prays without tahara, the salah is invalid. So half of the salah is taken care of the tahara before the salah. And again, half here does mean half, it means a part of. A part of salah is tahara. In that, without tahara, the salah is invalid. In another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala would not accept the salah if it is done without wudu. So according to the muhaddithun, this hadith is just basically conveying the same meaning. At-tuhuru shatrul iman. And so for them, it's in indicating the obligation of Tahara and the importance of Tahara. And this is why maintaining 
tahara is important. Maintaining a state of purity is important. The Prophet sallallahu said that only the true believers will maintain their wudu. It's, it's a good state to be in. So, at-tuhuru shatrul iman. And then the hadith continued. So the person said, the Prophet sallallahu said, At-tuhuru shatrul iman. Walhamdulillahi tamla'u al-mizan. And the statement, Alhamdulillah, fills the scales on Yawm al-Qiyamah. The scales of Yawm al-Qiyamah, which according to the Ash'ari, belief will be a physical scale. And whether it's one for everybody, or everybody would have their own scale, to, to, to weigh their own actions, there's a difference of opinion among the scholars of Kalam. There's no any tarjih in the, in the Ash'ari school, it's equal position. Some say it will be one, some say it will be different scales for everybody. So the scales that will judge the actions in Yawm Al-Qiyam. There's also a difference of opinion among the scholars of Kalam, what will be weighed? Is it the books? of our deeds, one the go, book of good deeds in one scale, the book of bad deeds in the other, or is it the actions itself? Would the actions be made, converted into some form that can be measured? These are all differences of opinion, and anything that has to do with the sam'iyat, anything that has to do with that which can only be known through revelation, we have to accept it and submit to it. So we submit to it and we don't know exactly what it is, but we believe in whatever is conveyed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So on the scales of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Alhamdulillah tamla'ul mizan. That the word Alhamdulillah, if it is placed in the deeds, the, the scale of good deeds, it will encompass the entire scale. In other words, that is how big the word Alhamdulillah is represented on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. When we convert that, the, through the conversions, one Alhamdulillah equals to something big. That's what the Prophet has been. That can cover the scale. Somebody's bad deeds can be many, but in the good scale, just one instant of saying Alhamdulillah can outweigh every bad deed. This is why we don't think little of these any kalimat, these, these statements of dhikr are big. People judge things based on the scales of the dunya. It's something that we get caught up with all the time. The metrics, what metrics are we using? If we use the metrics of dunya, somebody can say, maybe this action is better than your dhikr. We don't know. The Prophet said, Alhamdulillah tamla'ul mizan. One instance of, of gratitude covers the mizan. Why? Because Alhamdulillah, we mentioned this in the beginning of the book when we looked at the khutbah, the introduction of Imam al Nabawi. What is meant by Alhamdulillah? Alhamd means Jamia al Muhammad. Every praise, either in actuality, every time somebody utters a phrase of praise, that belongs to Allah. That it's Lillah means is milk. It is owned by Allah. If somebody gives it to other than Allah, they're giving a property that belongs only to Allah to other than Allah. Or it means al-jins. Al, this alif lam can be lil-jins. Mean the genus of praise, all of it belongs to Allah. Can only be given to Allah. So when somebody says alhamdulillah, they are saying that I believe that all good qualities belong to Allah. Anything that is worthy of praise, anything that would make, that would make something praiseworthy, and any gratitude, and any actual instant of praising, all of it belongs to Allah. That's not light. That belief is not a simple belief. So if somebody says, Alhamdulillah, they're literally saying, anything, all praiseworthy, I belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So because of that, one instance of Alhamdulillah, if somebody is sincere in it, they feel it, they believe in it, then it tamla ul mizan. It, it covers the scales. So Alhamdulillah tamla ul mizan. 
Some of the ulama say that Alhamdulillah in this hadith refers to Al-Fatiha. Because Surah Al-Fatiha is called Surah Alhamdulillah. But this is a weak opinion. The majority say that it means the statement Alhamdulillah or any of the derivatives of that. If somebody says Hamdan Lillah or Ahmadullah, any, any, just Hamd, giving Hamd to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Tamla'u al Mizan. And then the narrator said, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Wasubhanallahi walhamdulillahi tamla'ani aw tamla'. The narrator was unsure whether the Prophet sallallahu said tamla'ani, the two of them uh, fills or the two of them fill or tamla' that statement fills ma bayna samawati wal ard. What is between the heavens and the earth? Meaning, if somebody says Alhamdulillah, that Alhamdulillah fills the scales. If they say Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, it fills the scales plus what is between the heavens and the earth. This is why the four best statements is to say Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, Wala ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar. Because in different narrations, from the Prophet Sallallahu it fills the scales, it fills what is between the heavens and the earth, it fills the entire oceans, yani, or it fills all of the creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Meaning, if it were to be converted into things, this is what it will cover. It's like the Prophet Sallallahu saying to the companions, imagine if somebody says, SubhanAllah, Walhamdulillah, look out. You can imagine you're in the desert and the person has said, look, look out there. All that you can see between the heavens and the earth, that statement, if it were to be a physical object, imagine like a mountain or something, it will cover all of that. To say, subhanallah, walhamdulillah. The ulama differ as to, is the hadith saying both combined or each of them individually? Is, is the hadith saying, alhamdulillah, one instance of it fills the scale. Then another Alhamdulillah fills what is between the heavens and the earth. Or one SubhanAllah fills between what is between the heavens and the earth. Or is it saying to combine, to say SubhanAllah, Walhamdulillah, that combination fills between what is in between the heavens and the earth. It doesn't matter. I mean it does matter. But what I'm saying is all of it is, is huge rewards. This is the rewards of dhikr. And this is why the people of dhikr is praised so much in the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Because these are not light statements. They in the, they're, they're easy to say. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said that they khafifatani ala lisan. It's light, it's easy to say. But thaqilatani ala mizan. But they are heavy on the scales. And one hadith says, to say Alhamdulillah and then it gives a reward and then he says to say SubhanAllah and he gives a lower reward and then he says to say La ilaha illallah and he gives a lower reward. Based on that the ulama say that Alhamdulillah has more fadl, has more merit than tasbih. Tahmeed to say Alhamdulillah has a higher merit than to say SubhanAllah. And to say subhanallah has a higher merit than to say la ilaha illallah based on those hadith. And then to say la ilaha illallah has a higher merit than to say Allahu Akbar. This is according to the Shafi'i scholar, according to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, it's, it's different. To say la ilaha illallah is better than all of it. And when we say this, we mean to say la ilaha illallah as dhikr. Not la ilaha illallah that brings a person into Islam. The statement of la ilaha illallah that brings a person into Islam is better than anything else. Even salah. So, and, and the ulama explain why. Because tahmeed, as we said, is ithbat. Tahmeed is affirming every good quality of Allah Azawajal. Every perfection belongs to Allah. Tasbih is to do nafi. Tasbih to say subhanallah is to negate all imperfections from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and the principle in in usul or in mantiq that we have is ithbat awla min al nafi to affirm something is at a higher station than to negate something so since tahmid to say alhamdulillah is an affirmation of all perfection for allah but tasbih is a negation of imperfection of allah or from allah azza wa jal we see that tahmid is at a higher station than tasbih and la ilaha illallah is a confirmation of both and the confirmation is lower than an initial affirmation if we have for a co- in a court case for example the first person that testifies something he affirms something and then four or three other witness confirm what he said which is more which is prior the initial affirmation is more gives is given more precedence than the confirmation so since la ilaha illallah is a confirmation of both tahmid and tasbih is at a lower rank according to the ulama and this is only in terms of rewards in terms of the meaning and attributing perfection to allah and, and all of that we say it's it's equivalent in glorifying allah what we're talking about is the rewards because hadith indicates different ranks in terms of the rewards so subhanallah walhamdulillah tamla'an or tamla'u ma bayna as-samawati wal ard and then he said was salatu nurun and salah is light salah is nur here we can interpret the hadith in two ways in terms of language either it's called tashbih balighh tashbih balighh is a complete simile in the arabic language we can say for example uh, muhammad is like a lion in his bravery that statement says that muhammad so you have the the person we are comparing we have the tool of comparison which is the word like this is how we know we are comparing because we use the word like then we say lion like i don't know if i'm saying that lion the animal lion so that's the thing to which muhammad is being compared and then we have in his bravery we're we're explaining the it's called wajh at tashbih what is what is the the angle of comparison so this is called a full simile but a a higher more rhetorically valuable simile is when we negate the tool and we take out the word like and we negate or we remove the angle of comparison and we just say muhammad is a lion so we can interpret the hadith in that way as salatu nurun sala is light without saying it is like light or saying why we're calling it light using sala is light another way we can understand the the hadith that statement is that it is the thing that enlightens so nur means munawwir as salatu munawwirun sala enlightens it brings light it gives light to the person who prays it is illuminating to the heart this is common in the arabic language to say one thing but you mean a different angle there are eight types of it one type is you say the thing but you mean what it does so yeah yeah you yeah. can give me the massager but anyway i mean anyway the point so as salatu either nur or munawwir in terms of how we understand the hadith it it brings about light what does it mean it brings about light first of all in the dunya it brings it it enlightens the faces of people so the in the alam al malakut in the non physical realm of the existing world the light of these people are seen 
in the non-physical realm of the existing world, meaning the world that we occupy. The world that we occupy, there's the physical aspect of it, and then there's the spiritual aspect of it. Sorry, my sinuses are acting up. So, the, the, the part of the world accessed by spirits, by arwah, by jinns, by angels, by... If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifts the veils of people, they can see and they can access that world. The light of people who pray can be seen in that world. I don't want to sound too strange, but like for example, people who sometimes jinns, maybe if you speak to jinns or people are possessed by jinns, sometimes when you bring, when, when you convert a jinn, this all sounds strange, but if you convert a jinn that possess somebody, the jinn becomes a Muslim, that light flickered <laughs> in a strange time. <laughs> it was like we're, we're being spoken about. <laughs> so if, like sometimes they, when you convert jinns that are possessing people, as they're converting, they start to see the light of the Muslims around them. And sometimes you will hear them say, what is that light? Like they'll say what is like, they get scared by it. Because somehow they, the kufr blocked them from seeing it. But when they become Muslims, they start to see the nur in that realm. And they ask, like you actually hear them say, what is that light on that person or on you? Or what is this that I'm seeing? So the light of iman is seen in that realm. The more people pray, the more the light in that realm is increased. So when we say it gives light, in the dunya, this is what we mean. It is seen in that realm of the existing world. People, Muslims, in, in, the, in, the, in the alam al-mulk, in the physical world that we live in right now, that we experience, most people experience. In that world, we can still see something of the light of salah on the faces of people. When people come in, like you can go to a masjid or you can go into a surah and you can look at everybody, their physical faces. And you can suspect who is somebody who prayed tahajjud and who did it. You can see somebody, you can tell. If, I, if somebody were to ask you, of all of these people, we were to guess who prayed tahajjud last night, who prayed the sunnah for all of their prayers so far? You can probably look at their faces and guess it. If somebody says guess, because the nur of, of a'mal can be seen on the faces of people. This is why scholars and people of ilm and people of amal, people of practice, sometimes people look at them and they can almost swear that I'm seeing a physical light. So that, that's what it means. as salatu nurun. It enlightens people's faces in the dunya, but also in the akhirah. There's a hadith that says that the people of salah will show up on yawm al-qiyamah and their faces will be as bright ka uh, al-qamar laylat al-badri. Like the full moon. That the way you see the full moon, that's their faces in the akhirah. This will, because that realm in the akhirah is, is a spiritual realm. So all of the spiritual realities of people will show up in the akhirah. It also means that the beings that have access to that realm in the dunya, that's how they see people. They say that the people of Quran, for example, there's a hadith that says the people of the Quran, the angels, when they look at the people of the earth, they see them shining the way when we look into the sky, the way we see different stars shining. Some you can tell are brighter than others because of how much Qur'an they recite. So same thing here with Salah. When the angels look at the people of the earth, the people of Salah, the more you pray, the, the brighter your illumination is to the angels. 
So as-salatu nurun, the first meaning is that it, it enlightens people in the dunya and in the akhirah. Another meaning of the hadith is that it's an enlightenment of the heart, illumination of the heart. Al-Imam Al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that the basira operates similar to the basar. The basar, basara, basar is the physical sight, physical eyes. What I see around me, right now I can see this glass and I can see this room and I can see everything that I can see right now because of my basar. My physical sight that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows uh, for me to see. Basira is insight. So you have sight and insight. Basira is the sight of the heart. The spiritual heart. So Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala he said, The person in order for your basar to see, first it must not have defects. You must not have blindness. You must not have any physical problems. That's the first thing. The second thing is you must open your eyes. If somebody has the ability to see but close his eyes, he cannot see anything. But once you open your eyes, there must be light. If there is no light, then there is no physical sight. If you go, if you go into a dark room, you have no defects, you open your eye, it doesn't mean you'll see anything. For you to see something, you have to have light, physical light. And the clarity with which you will see the things around you depends on how bright that light is. So if we come into this dark room at night, for example, and we open our eyes and we put on one light or a dim light, we probably won't see what's at the back there. For us to see there, we have to increase the physical light. So Imam al-Ghazali said, the basira operates in the same way. The insight, the spiritual sight, operates in the same way. First, it must not have any defects. If there's defects, then there's no sight. So you cannot have kufr. You won't have insight if you have kufr, because that's like ama, that's like blindness. And the Quran, Calls it blindness. Nifaq and kufr summun bukmun umyun fahum la yarji'oon. So those defects must, must be absent. Once it is absent, that must be opened. It's like the physical eye, once defects are absent and you close your eyes, you cannot see. So you must open the eyes of the basira with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must open that eye by contemplating on the, the, magne, the grandeur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you must think about your condition, you think about the creation of Allah, you open up your eyes. But then once you open the basira, once you open the inner eye, in order for you to see there must be light, like the basar. So when the Prophet sallallahu said, as-salatu nurun, then that's a light. Open your insight and put on that light so that you can see spiritual realities. You can see reality beyond the physical world. You can see the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can see the temporariness of the dunya. You can see dunya for what it is and akhirah for what it is. So as-salatu nurun with that meaning. That's one of the meanings. Salah is a light that allows us to see the realities of existence. Another meaning is that darkness, there's a hadith that says, whenever somebody does something wrong, something haram, a dark spot appears on the heart. Physi not the physical heart, the spiritual heart. That darkness prevents people from connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a physical darkness. It's a spiritual darkness. It's the gloom. It's an overcast that block us from seeing reality for what it is. So if 
doing wrong things darkens the heart. Those darkness or that darkness is removed by tawbah and by doing good deeds. The more we can avoid the bad, the less dark the heart will be. And the Quran says that salah tanha anil fahsha. Salah prevents people from committing fahsha wal munkar. The salah, if people are upright in their salah and they're praying on time and they're trying to do it properly, then in between the prayers, it, that prayer, the spiritual gains from that prayer will prevent them from doing haram things in between the different prayers, between Fajr and Dhuhr and Dhuhr and Asr and so on. So if that, if the Salah prevents you from doing wrong and not doing wrong means you're not putting darkness on the heart, then that's the meaning of as salah to Nurun. As salah Nurun, Salah yani tanha an al fahsha Salah prevents darkness from overtaking the heart. So that's another meaning given by the ulama. So light in the dunya and in the akhirah, light that allows us to see reality for what it is, light in the sense that it prevents us from doing wrong thing and therefore covering the heart with black spots. And this is why the Prophet wasallam was the most enlightened of people because he was the most he was the person that prayed the most. And when he prayed, he prayed the most sincerely. He loved prayer. He said that salah was something made delightful to me. And salah was uh, any. There's a hadith in which Jibreel came to him and said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made salah an enjoyment for you. So do as much of it as you want. And he partake in it as you please. And it gave him ease. Salah is something that gave him raha, gave him ease. This is why when he used to tell Bilal radiallahu anhu to call the adhan, how would he instruct him to call the adhan? He say, Ya Bilal, arihna bil, bil salah. O Bilal, bring ease to us by announcing the prayer. Because it's a time to forget dunya. And the responsibilities of the Prophet ﷺ were many. He had the responsibilities of a qadi, and the responsibilities of a husband, and the responsibilities of a father, the responsibilities of a prophet, and the responsibilities of a commander of an army. And there so many responsibilities. So if somebody is, has so many responsibilities, and salah is that thing that calls you to put the dunya behind your back and to step into a different realm, it, it brings ease. And that's what we should try to have in salah. When you're in salah, you forget everything in the dunya. Forget COVID and forget when school is going to reopen and have these kids not bother me anymore and forget about the economy and forget about if we're going to have a second or third wave or forget about, you know, are we going to face a recession? Just take those Raka'at and just forget everything. Arihna bil salah. This is what he used to tell Bilal. Just give us ease because we're stepping out of the dunya in salah. So it's illumination in the sense that it takes away, it eases, it brings lightness from the heaviness of dunya. So as salatu nurun. And then he continued from there. We'll stop here. Continue in the next session, inshallah ta'ala. Hada wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'ina wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.